Thank you, Pastor Jonathan. Good to see each of you here today. Glad that you could uh, come to worship the Lord. Aren't you glad that we can get together uh, on Sunday mornings to worship the Lord together? Isn't that awesome? Yeah. Very, very thankful for our, our assembly. And uh, yeah, well, this morning we're just going to bow in a word of prayer before I get into God's Word. Would you bow with me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we're grateful for the opportunity that we have, God, to come here and to focus on you. And Jesus, we, we do come here for you because you are worthy, God, and, and we, we want to lift up your name, Lord, in worship, and we want to honor you, Lord, this morning, and we want to encourage one another, Lord. And Father, we pray that this day would just be a blessing uh, to you. And that, Father, in the midst of that, Lord, we know that you bless us. And we thank you for all of that, Lord. And God, as we get into your word this morning and as we talk about giving our very best to you, Lord, this morning, um, may you just bring the word to life, Lord, through my, my, uh, my lips, Lord. And, and may people's hearts be opened by the Holy Spirit to hear what it is that your spirit says to the church this morning through your word. And we praise you. We praise you and we thank you in Jesus' name, amen. So we're continuing our series in the book of John, and we come to the passage uh, of Scripture just past the point where Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. And our text this morning is in John chapter 11, uh, verse 45, to John chapter 12, verse 11. After Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead in Bethany, many people who witnessed his actions believed that he was the promised Messiah. However, that being said, there were some, for whatever reason, that were blind to the facts that were presented to them. Regardless of the miracles that occurred, Jesus' revelation produce two responses, and, and it's the same today, no matter what God does amongst people in this world, there's going to be two different responses. For some, the miracle of life that God brings and that He shows produces repentance and a humble adoration of God for displaying His glory. And for others, there is a hardening that occurs and a continued blindness. Amazingly, some people will not believe even if the fact that someone has been raised from the dead is plain for them to see. They still will not believe. And Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead and Lazarus had been in the grave for four days. And Jesus delayed His appearance um, at that place specifically so there could be no question that Lazarus was a dead man that was brought back to life. So here we pick up, starting with John chapter 11, verse 45. Therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees called a meeting of the Sanhedrin. What are we accomplishing? They asked. Here is this man performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and then the Romans will come and take away both our temple and our nation. See, the chief priests and the Pharisees, they couldn't deny that Jesus had performed incredible miracles with the raising of Lazarus from the dead and all the, the witnesses that were present. That was the greatest miracle of all of the miracles that Jesus performed. And despite all of Christ's miracles, these men were deceived into believing that they were right and that Jesus was wrong. 
They refused to attribute the miracles Jesus was performing to being from God. Strangely, in the case of the Pharisees, they attributed actually the miracles that Jesus was performing as being derived from the power of Satan. Rather than accepting Jesus as their Messiah, he was looked at as being some kind of magician, some kind of master magician, manipulating dark powers to accomplish the impossible. The fact is, however, that when you diligently study the Scriptures, and these men did diligently study the Scriptures, they should have known that Satan can bring death, but he can never bring life. The Pharisees should have known this. And in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 6, it's written, The Lord brings death and makes alive. He brings down to the grave and he raises up. Without God's permission, Satan is not able to do anything. He cannot create and he cannot search the human heart. It is important for us to understand that in the conflict between God and Satan, it is not really a struggle between two great, equal, and opposing powers with the outcome still in doubt. No, all power and all authority belongs to God and God alone. Satan has never and never will have the authority to raise a dead person back to life. He is a created being. He is not the creator. He does not have power over life. Although he desires it, Satan will never be equal to the Lord. Every person that's raised from the dead, every time a person is raised from the dead, it's a, it's a stupendous miracle showing that God, who is himself the source of life, can give life to whoever he wills to give it, even after dead, death. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. In John 5.21, Jesus told his disciples this. He said, For just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the Son gives life to whoever he is pleased to give it. Now the enraged priests and Pharisees should have known that Jesus couldn't be doing what he was doing if God were not with him. There were a few Pharisees that did recognize this. Some of the leaders of the Pharisees actually recognized this, Nicodemus being one. But they, as a whole group, they were bent on having things done the way that they envisioned. And the Messiah had come, if he was going to be coming into the world, the Messiah had come to embellish what they were doing, to, to back up what they were doing, to approve of the way they were doing things. They wouldn't accept any Messiah who would dare to say that they were not doing things the right way. As for Jesus, Jesus did not play according to their rules. So in their mind, they were right, and there must be another explanation. He must be wrong. In Matthew 15, 8-9, Jesus publicly called out these religious leaders saying, these people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. So the Pharisees and the Sadducees, see the teachers of the law were Sadducees, the, uh, the, the ruling priesthood were Sadducees. They opposed Jesus wherever they could keep people from following him. But all of their official disapproval, their excommunication of Jesus out of synagogues and counter-teaching were doing nothing to stop Jesus' influence over the people. More and more people were coming to believe in him. And rather than laying down their pride and admitting they were wrong, these chief priests and Pharisees were filled with a frenzied anger against the Lord. And in the light of what Jesus did in raising Lazarus from the dead, it's really crazy when you think about it that anyone would 
oppose him, particularly those entrusted to the law of Moses and the law of God. The truth of the matter is that their crazy behavior is the same as the crazy behavior that we see today when God shows himself to people and they reject him. They oppose God. These men oppose God because they love their sin. And it's the same today. People will be shown the gospel. God will show great things to them in their lives, but they will not come. They will not bow the knee of their hearts because they are in love with their sin. In the case of the Pharisees and the ruling priests, they sinned because everything they did was for power, control, and prestige. They longed for the approval of men rather than approval from God. The Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 1, verses 20 and 21, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God, nor gave thanks to Him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. God has clearly revealed His eternal power and divine nature through creation. But people throughout history, have suppressed the truth in the unrighteousness of their unyielded, darkened, sin-laden hearts. And sadly, one of the hardened and unyielding hearts belonged to the man in Jesus' day who was supposed to be the intercessor between God and His people. In the hardness of his heart, he did not fulfill his duty as high priest before God, but instead chose to play politics for the approval of men. In verse 49 of our text, we read, Then one of them named Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, spoke up. You know nothing at all. You do not realize that it is better for you that one man die for the people than for the whole nation to perish. Than, for the whole na- than that the whole nation perish, rather. In reference to Caiaphas, John goes on to tell us in verse 51, he did not say this on his own, but as high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation, and not only for that nation, but also for the scattered children of God to bring them together and make them one. So from that day on, they plotted to take his life. Now several ancient Jewish writings besides the New Testament reference Caiaphas the high priest. They tell us that the Jewish high priest, Joseph Caiaphas, was a Sadducee. And he was a member of a powerful and important priestly family in Jerusalem. And he operated as the high priest in the temple in Jerusalem for a period of 18 years. And he was presiding over the ruling court, religious court of the day, during Jesus' time, called the Sanhedrin. The fact that he was a Sadducee gives us a clue as to why Caiaphas was so intent on putting down anything that could potentially upset their delicately balanced apple cart. Now, unlike the Pharisees, you see, the Pharisees were tied in knots over their religious traditions that an endless human designed and derived regulations. The Sadducees were different. They were they were worldly minded individuals. To the Sadducee, Christianity endangered the big business of religion, undermining their profitable but wicked trades. We see an example later when Jesus goes into the temple courts and they are selling animals for sacrifice. That was all arranged by these, this priestly class who are looking to benefit, to be benefactors materially, from the trade. So, they undermined the truth by pursuing unjust gain. In Jesus' day, the Sadducees, they, they, they were rich aristocrats. They were, they were a li- religious faction, and, and most of the power in that society 
was controlled by the, the Sadducees. They are kind of right next to the Romans. They were, they were aristocrats. A lot of people didn't like them because of that, but the Sadducees were known as much for their wealth and corruption as for their religious devotion to the temple system. Now their primary concern was maintaining the status quo to protect their economic interests and elite status. They favored cooperation with the Romans to ensure their power remained unchallenged. And they played politics with the Romans to keep first century Israel in order solely for the benefit of their material comfort and their enrichment. Although the general population struggled under Roman oppression, the Sadducees actually benefited from it. And in their theology, the Sadducees actually didn't believe in life after death. They didn't believe in angels. They didn't believe in demons. They didn't believe in any of that. It was very secular in their mind. So everything they did was for the present and for their material posterity. The ruling priests were not Pharisees, but were Sadducees. To them, Jesus was a political threat. If too many people started believing in Jesus, the Sadducees were afraid that they would lose their happy lot in life. They loved the flowing robes. They loved the honorable positions. They loved the fact that they had power. Jesus and his disciples were tiresome, annoying, profit-destroying threats who represented a, a threat to the quality of living. And if you don't believe in life after death, everything is about right here and right now. So this is Caiaphas, the high priest, was a member of this sect called the Sadducees. So the Pharisees, they, they wanted to kill Jesus for disagreeing with their self-serving religious systems that they had developed over years. And the Sadducees wanted to kill Jesus for bringing the potential to anger the Romans and end their comfortable, luxurious life. As opposite as both of these groups were, and they were opposites, they didn't get along. In this particular case, the Pharisees and the ruling priests formed a wicked alliance to try and bring an end to Jesus' influence over the Jewish people. Caiaphas meant to emphasize that Jesus should be killed so that their nation might continue in Rome's favor. But he didn't realize that in his statement about Jesus that we read here, he was actually playing into God's plan. As acting high priest, Caiaphas spoke prophetically that Jesus Christ should be sacrificed as the last sacrificial lamb in the temple system to provide substitutionary atonement for the sins of the people. By substitutionary atonement, I mean that Jesus was to be sacrificed to die instead of us, to save us from the wrath of God against sin so that we could be made spiritually clean and brought back or reconciled to be at one with God. Atonement means at one minute, to be brought back to oneness. In his epistle, John the Apostle says in 1 John chapter 2, 2, he, referring to Jesus, is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. And this is why John the Baptist, prior to starting his, the ministry of Jesus, while, while he watched Jesus walking towards him, declared, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is why Caiaphas worked into the hand of God. Actually, in his pronouncement of judgment, and his encouragement for them to kill Jesus, he was prophetically stating that Jesus Christ would become the substitutionary sacrifice of God, even, if, even though he didn't realize it. See, it wasn't Passover season yet. And it wasn't time for Jesus to be crucified, because Jesus was to be crucified during the season of Passover. You see, the Passover lamb was the sacrifice where people were released from slavery. 
in Egypt. This was the, the, the pattern of the Messiah to be sacrificed would follow the, the pattern of the Passover when the angel of death came across the camp and the people of Israel had the blood of the Lamb painted over the doorposts entering their house whenever that death angel came to a house with the blood of the Lamb applied to the threshold of that house, he would pass over it and there would be life that would be given instead of death. You see, Jesus is the Passover Lamb. The Messiah is the Passover Lamb. And this is what Isaiah predicted in the past. We, we read these scriptures at Christmas about Jesus being the Lamb of God who gave his life. He was beaten and, and uh, he was pierced for our transgressions, right? He was bruised for iniquities. The penalty that was placed upon him brought us peace. And by his stripes, the beating that he took, we are healed, spiritually made right before God. All we who live are like lambs. And God laid on him the iniquity of us all. See, he died not only for our sins, but also the sins of the entire world. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. The Son of God did not come into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. So, Caiaphas played into this. And in verse 54, we see, because it wasn't the Passover yet, see, this happened about six days, they figure, before Passover. So this is just prior to the crucifixion of Christ, a week before. John continues in verse 54, stating, Therefore Jesus no longer moved about publicly among the people of Judea. Instead, he withdrew to a region near the wilderness to a village called Ephraim, which he stayed, where he stayed with his disciples. So his departure, when you think about it, symbolizes the judicial judgment that was about to fall on Israel. It was a prophetic drama acted out as if to say, if you reject me, I will withdraw and you will not have the light among you. Hiding himself also reflects the truth that John had repeatedly shown that Jesus would die in accordance with the Father God's timetable, not whenever the Jews wanted to kill him. It would fall within the timetable preordained by God, the Father. So Jesus and his disciples withdrew to stay in Ephraim. Ephraim was a small town, approximately 21 kilometers northwest, northeast of Jerusalem, in the wilderness on a great big mound. So you could see Jerusalem on one side, and you look over to the other side, you could see uh, the Jordan Valley towards, towards Jericho. So they stayed in this little town until the time came when they were to enter and head towards Jerusalem for the finale. So here, in verse 55, when it was almost time for the Passover, Jewish Passover, many went up from the country to Jerusalem for their ceremony clen ceremonial cleansing rather, before the Passover. They kept looking for Jesus, and as they stood in the temple courts, they asked one another, what do you think? Isn't he coming to the festival at all? But the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that anyone who found out where Jesus was should report it so that they might arrest him. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here, a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those who reclined at the table with him. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume, she poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. So this was six days before the Passover. And Jesus was aware that his time on earth was short. And he chose to go to spend time with the ones that he was closest to socializing with the people that had surrounded him when he had raised Lazarus from the dead. And, you see, when he came to the place where Lazarus was staying, 
where Mary and Martha were and where this feast was to be held in his honor, there's a cultural tradition in this era when a guest of honor attends your house, you would have a servant in your house, if you had a servant, wash your guest's feet, finishing the job before they entered in and reclined at the table. Now, we don't, they didn't have chairs the same way that they do. They, they'd recline, they kind of lay on their side and there'd be a table before them and their feet would be out one side. This is how they always, the Jews were very, very um, specific about being clean. So when people would come in off the dirty road uh, in their sandals in this area, the, the, the tradition would be to wash feet before they reclined. And, and, and it was tradition that a servant would, would do this job for the master of the house, the hired servant. And then after the feet were washed, a dab of perfume was placed on that guest's feet. This is a tradition. But Mary, we see, she, she came to Jesus. She, she postured as a servant. She stooped down and not only dabbed perfume on Jesus' feet, but poured out a pint of very expensive perfume called pure nard on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. Now at this time in history, nard, pure nard, was extracted from a certain flowering plant actually in the Himalayan mountains in Asia. Countries like China, India, and Nepal had this plant that they made this perfume oil out of called nard. So this perfume that Mary had in Israel had been transported from Asia all the way to where she was. It's very likely this perfume was, that maybe she had plans for it for using on Lazarus. I don't know. It, it, it doesn't really say where, where, maybe she went down to the market and she purchased it. But the Bible tells us that this, this perfume was purchased and it was very expensive. Um, that oil had been used as a, as a currency in ancient cultures for thousands of years. Uh, this nard perfume was used as a currency. So you keep it and you could actually exchange it for currency. And this particular pint of nard was worth a year of a common person's wages. So Mary was so thankful to the Lord for raising her brother back to life, she spared no expense trying to honor and bless him. She knew that Jesus was the Messiah, so spending her savings on such a costly gift was something she wanted to do to honor God. She knew that Jesus had come to save Israel, and because of this, she knew he was worthy of receiving not only a little bit of what she had, but her very best. How does this example relate to us today, you see? Well, I believe that when Jesus comes and he brings his resurrection life to us, right? He calls us by name. He lifts us out of the mire, out of the, the depths of our depravity and our sin. He rescues us from death. And he sets our feet upon a rock and he calls us his friends. Wow, what, a, what an incredible privilege it is to have the Most High God humble himself to the point where he would care for me and for you. This is the way our God is. He's very, he died for the sins of the world. As many who would receive him, to them gave he the power to become the sons and daughters of God. He did this for you. See, but oftentimes when people are saved, they don't posture the same way that, that Mary did. They, they're not grateful the same that Mary was for what Jesus had done. Are you grateful this morning? I'm going to ask you. Are you grateful this morning for what Jesus has done to save you? Amen. I pray that you are. I have to ask myself, am I grateful? Am I truly grateful? And when your heart is grateful for everything that God has given to you, what is the posture in response? The posture in response should be if we truly are grateful and we truly see that from the depths that God has rescued us, that we give him our very best, whatever that is. 
that the very best of our lives, rather than the dregs of our life and what's left over at the end, and we kind of give him, you know, kind of like, you know, people, you know how people donate things to people that are in need, you know. Oh, I don't need this old thing. I'm going to throw it in the dumpster anyway, so I might as well give it to someone. That doesn't make a lot of sense if you're trying to, if, if you really appreciate that person, and if you really want us to say, I really appreciate you, you you're not going to do that. How many times in working in benevolence, you come and you go like, gee, that pair of underwear has seen a few years. <laughs> yeah, there's holes. It's not underwear that you wear to church. It's not that. Yeah. Well, they're holy, but not that. Yeah. <laughs> But you see, you know what I mean, right? I mean, people cleaning out their closets and oh, I'm going to throw this out anyways. I might as well donate it to someone. No, no, no. When you, when you have received everything from someone, you're going to bless them with something good, right? You're going to bless them with the, the very best that you can give them. You know? Some believers are, are like that with what God's given them. Oh yeah, Jesus has saved me from sin. Okay, well, we give them the very last few ble fleeting moments of our day in prayer, you know. When, you know, it becomes a matter of, of, of tradition when we pray over our meal. It's like, you know, he who eats the fastest gets the most, you know, like, What I'm saying, folks, is this. When God impacts your life, Mary is the example of what happens. When, they rec when you recognize what Jesus has done, Mary is the example. When I give to the Lord, no matter in, in what area of my life, whether it's my gifts, my talents, my abilities, my time, my finances, whatever, am, am, I, am I showing God that I'm thankful? I can't answer that question. This is, this is a very personal question. How is your heart? That's what I'm, I'm asking. How is your heart? Is your heart postured in thankfulness and gratefulness to God, and are you correspondingly giving Him what is actually His anyways? Your life does not belong to you. When you become a believer in Jesus Christ, your life is no longer your own. You were purchased with a price. Everything that we, I think Morgan said it here, this wasn't actually scripted. He said it this morning. Right? I come to give God everything. Why? Because He's given me everything. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills, including the cattle in my pen, including the things that I've been given, my house. My life, my talents, my abilities, my time. It's all the Lord's. So therefore, in response, may our hearts be generous like Mary because it all belongs to Him. You can't outgive the Lord, you know that? You, you pour your talents, your abilities, your energies into serving Christ. He will bless you on so many fronts. You won't even be able to handle the blessing that will come. I'm not talking about material prosperity Although God does take care of us, and sometimes He just smiles and gives us something that's really cool, right? It's like, wow. He knows how to give good gifts to His people, but what I'm saying is the peace of God, the life in Christ, the blessings of all of that, that beautiful community with Christ are ours. Why? Because He is good. God is so good. He is so good to me. God deserves our very best, folks. We need to devote our entire strength and souls to serving Him. He's not just the person to turn to in times of trouble. We need to be a living sacrifice. Our lives, a living sacrifice to Him. If Colossians Colossians 3.23, the Apostle Paul instructs the church saying, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart. Did you hear that? Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart. 
When we're talking heart, what are we talking about? Ooh, spirit inside us with everything that we are. God, I give you everything that I am and everything that I have It belongs to you and I willingly surrender. I surrender, God. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. It's not like the Sadducees that did things so that people would look at them and go, hey, look at that guy. He's really, he's really good. Right? They were looking human approval. Oh, look at, look at him. He's holy. He's good. He, he's awesome. No, we're doing what we do as to the Lord, not for human masters. I would counsel you to evaluate where your heart is today. Only God knows where this is. Okay, I can't say that. I can't. We can't place that on anyone else. We've got to be, this is time between us and God. Like, Lord, See if there's anything in me that needs to change. Please, Lord. All I can say is that if your hearts are grateful like Martha who made the banquet in Jesus' honor and Mary who postured with this bar, jar of perfume and gave her very best to the Lord, we won't regret giving God our best. We won't regret it. What's contrasted is what we see next with Judas Iscariot. See, Judas Iscariot he walked in full view of the miraculous work of the Savior. He participated with the other 12 in the life and work of Christ in an intimate way that none of us could, even, could, could understand because we were never there. But can you imagine seeing Jesus put his hands on people and seeing lepers cleansed, blind eyes opened, being in the middle of the Sea of Galilee and having him walk out on the water getting into the boat, looks at the sea and says, peace be still, and everything will go still instantly. 5,000 5, men seated on a hillside listening to the teaching of Christ were fed with five small loaves and two fishes. The bread was multiplied. All these miracles, Lazarus in the grave for four days, Judas Iscariot was there for all of it. He was there. He saw the miracles. He heard the Lord's teachings firsthand. Yet his heart was rotten and unyielded to the truth of who Jesus was. John continues in chapter 12, verse 4. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And as a keeper of the, as a keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. <laughs> such audacity sinful motive is often hidden under the mask of another virtue Judas didn't care anything about the poor he didn't care for the mission of Jesus or the disciples or anyone else except for himself he was ambitious and eager to be a part of Jesus' ministry because his heart was full of thievery and he knew that there would be ample opportunity for him to help himself to the abundant provisions as being part of the group that followed Christ. It happens today, too. People are involved in church. Why? Because it looks good. And it gives them business contacts. This is the heart of the Sadducee. If Jesus was to be accepted by people, the people as God's Messiah, then for Judas, his popularity would lead to Countless possibilities to attain wealth for himself. Think about it. The Messiah? Whoo! Bring it on. I can make some real coin out of this one if I play my cards right. Some people come to Christ attending these church, our churches supposing that this is a means to financial gain for them. See, they acknowledge the Lord with their lips, but their hearts are far from Him. If, if I've got this kind of heart today, I, wanna, I need to repent immediately. God, have mercy on me. Forgive me for my, for my wrong take on everything. I am so sorry. Well, you don't think that normal people like us could get distracted and, and deceived? It happens all the time. Sometimes we get 
put off track too. Well, anytime God puts his finger on an issue in our lives through his word, we're given the opportunity to posture. God, have mercy. Me, a sinner. I know that my heart sometimes goes astray, Lord. Would you forgive me, Lord, of the times when it does so that I can return? I'm not. May I decrease that you might increase, Lord? In the case of Mary, you see, she offered the, her best to Jesus in sacrificial love. Well, Judas Iscariot, he was coldly utilitarian. And Jesus only interested in him as a ladder for his own selfish ambitions. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came, not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well. For on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and believing in him. Amazingly, these men who had claimed to be representatives of God could be so hardened by their arrogance that they would be willing not only to kill the Lord Jesus who raised this man to life, but also the man who was bought, brought back from the grave himself. Both of them. So, Many people were becoming followers of Jesus. And the chief priests feared that they were going to lose their power and control over the people. They felt that their leader Caiaphas was justified in what he said. It's better for one man to die than the whole nation be taken away. At this point, rather than being won over by the miracle which had taken place in their wild madness, of unbelief, their resolve strengthened to destroy Jesus and kill the one who is the author of life, who, who raised Lazarus from the dead, and also to kill Lazarus as well. So today, folks, we just need to look at our hearts in response to the grace of God given to us so freely, are we postured like Mary? And if there's anything in our hearts that needs to go this morning, it's a good time to bow the knee to the Lord Jesus Christ and pray that he would forgive us and give us a new heart. In Jesus' name.